trick-or-treating. They will. They will. Yeah, if you're handing out free candy, there's going to be a way. Do you just wear a mask? Yeah. I Oops. think a lot of people are just kind of putting the bowl at the end of the okay. driveway and then maybe putting some chairs out and just watching people come and take. That way you can still enjoy the costumes or... I handed out candy one year and I loved it. I was so excited to see everyone just kind of go It's a lot out. of fun. It yeah. is a lot of just fun. To see what everybody dresses up as. So. Maybe I'll do it this year too. End of the driveway. We'll see. Yeah. All right, guys, you know what time it is. We've got six things you should know. And number one on our list, dozens of workers yesterday were putting the finishing touches on roads and signs in the Inca city of Machu Picchu, which will reopen this Sunday, November 1st. Now, that's after being closed and off limits for seven months due to the coronavirus pandemic. Now, visitors will have their temperature taken and will be required to comply to social distancing measures. They will also tour through four circuits across the well-known parts of the Citadel, which stands on close to three square miles on the border of the Andes and the Amazon. So Peru closed all its tourist venues beginning March 16th when it began a general lockdown to stop the advance of the coronavirus, which up to now has caused more than 34,000 deaths in the country. Machu Picchu is a tourism magnet in Peru and in 2018 it attracted 1.5 million visitors. The Inca Citadel hosted close to 400 people in the 15th century when it was built as a religious sanctuary for the Incas at an altitude of more than 8,000 feet. Whoa, talk about some altitude there. I was just in Utah, guys, you know that, but I was in um, Zion and it was really hard to breathe there. Yeah, like it's really elevation. Hard. If you've never like tried to run or hike in elevation, the air is much thinner. You get less oxygen at altitude, so you actually you struggle to breathe. I'm the same when I go there as well. Yeah, it's yeah. really it's really tough. I heard that like in a couple of weeks you kind of get accustomed to it though. You do. You got to drink a lot of water is usually and sometimes you get altitude sickness. I don't know if you got that. I did it. The bad Thank headaches. Goodness. You're lucky because that is not a lot of fun. I started getting headaches when I came back. You think that's related? Yeah, it could be your body just kind of readjusting the sea level. My body's like, no, we don't want to go back to work. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. You just have to get up and, and get in a routine again. That's why you have a headache. Yes. All right, guys, moving on. The Los Angeles Dodgers are the World Series champs. <laughs> so let's go to Arlington, Texas. The Dodgers beat the Tampa Bay Rays 3-1 to one last night to win the World the Series four really games nice. to two. This was the race last chance in the ninth, and then it was a party time for the Dodgers. The Dodgers' first World Series title so since 1988. I am. Shortstop Corey Seager <laughs> was named the World Series most valuable player. And by the way, the Los Angeles Lakers also won the NBA championship just two weeks ago. Coincidentally, the Dodgers and Lakers also both won their league's titles in 1998. So I didn't I'm know that. I'm from Arizona, so I'm a huge Arizona Diamondbacks fan. So we have a, a rivalry with the Dodgers that goes back many years. The Dodgers, when they clinched the division title a few years ago, Arizona, the baseball stadium, has a pool. And when the Dodgers clinched the division title, they went and they partied in the pool and they may have uh, relieved themselves in what? the pool. What? Yeah, so nobody likes the Dodgers no way. in Arizona. No yeah. That's not nice. I was hoping they would lose. But they did not. <laughs> but congratulations. They did not. I, I like that you still say congratulations, though. That's a that's being a good sport. Hate the team. I don't mind the players. I'm sure they're all fantastic people and Great good people. for them and their families. They've been through a lot this year as well. And absolutely. Hopefully they never win again. A nice time for L.A. because there there's a lot of celebration to be had. Must be nice. Wish we could be there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, guys, and moving on, scientists have discovered a new inflammatory syndrome in men that can be deadly. So NA NIH researchers studied the genome sequences from more than 2,500 people with undiagnosed inflammatory diseases, focusing on 800 genes. Now, they discovered 25 adult men that had mutations in the UBA1 gene, which resides in the X chromosome. Most had symptoms that included blood clots in veins, recurrent fevers, and pulmonary abnormalities. Following the finding, the scientists grouped the various conditions into a new disease called Vexus syndrome. The experts say about 40% of the Vexus patients studied have died. The discovery could lead to effective treatments for the rare disorder. And moving right along here, a small plane made an emergency landing in the field of an elementary school on Friday. Now, it happened at the W.D. Hall Elementary School in El Cajon, California. Now, the yellow plane you see there reportedly lost power to its engine and was forced to land. The plane stopped just yards away from a playground on school grounds. The pilot was the only passenger on board, and he was uninjured. It's unclear where the plane took off or where it was headed. The NTSB and FAA will be investigating 
the incidents. Yikes. Yikes. I'm so Indeed. happy that no one was harmed in this. For sure. And now an extraordinary view from above the Arctic Circle. So the Northern Lights, also known as Aurora Borealis, lit up the night sky in the Lapland region of Finland over the weekend. It's beautiful. Yeah, the sky turned shades of green, followed by streaks of white and purple. The colorful sky is a result of collisions between gases surrounding the Earth and matter released by the sun's atmosphere. I actually didn't know the signs behind the Northern Lights, so that's pretty interesting. Have you ever seen them? No. I want to see Have them you? so bad. Yeah, I've s maybe once, and I can't remember where I was that I was saw them. Maybe in Wisconsin, um, but they had. I remember they had a really neat Northern Lights display a yeah. few years ago, and you could actually buy a plane ticket and oh, go really? on the plane and actually see. I can't remember where it was or what it was all about, but it's definitely one of those bucket list goals because I don't remember. I'm probably so young I don't even remember it. But I that would be amazing when you're out there like. When, where you can see all the stars I just that just happened to me I was able to see like the Milky Way and it's just insane when you see that amount of stars because mm -hmm. when you're in the city or in a town there's just so many lights you can't really tell yeah so when you see it it kind of takes your breath away you're absolutely right now I want to see that one all right guys in London's Financial Times reported this week that the COVID-19 vaccine developed by Oxford University and AstraZeneca produces a strong immune response in elderly people now the er elderly are the most at risk for the coronavirus and the Financial Times said in early trials results the vaccine triggers antibodies and T cells in older age groups. Now this finding is similar to data released in July that showed the vaccine generated robust immune responses in a ground of healthy adults between 19 and 55 years old. Now at the same time researchers told the Financial Times that positive tests do not guarantee that the vaccine will ultimately prove safe and effective in older people. AstraZeneca is developing the vaccine with Oxford University researchers and AstraZeneca AstraZeneca resumed the U.S. trial, the experimental vaccine, after approval by U.S. regulators. The company said on Friday the company stopped the trial after a trial participant in the U.K. became ill. And that wraps up our six things you should know. But before we head to break, as October comes to an end, the new month of November approaches, and this is the time we pause to honor those who served our nation in uniform. Today, we share a piece of Monica Southall's life, which changed in an instant. While serving in Afghanistan, she was wounded in an accident. But her love for sports helped her cope and made her stronger. And Natalie Calabot has the story. We see a field of heroes who served their country, but Don Milne... When you look at his uh, date of death, it says June 5th, 1943. Right here, he sees thousands of stories desperate to be told. So Everett Ever Burkholz here was uh, actually born in Colorado. And he wants to tell as many of them as possible. Um, so they put him on a Belgian uh, liner. It was called the... Uh, SS Leopoldville. Milne lives in Utah, but visited Denver's Fort Logan National Cemetery as part of his new project, Stories Behind the Stars. His location on the ship, he probably was killed by the torpedo. He spent the last three years researching and writing about the fallen heroes of World War II. Just because it was an accident doesn't mean that we shouldn't remember people like Everett. His goal is to compile short histories of each of the 400,000 plus American service members killed in that war. I got into this because I started just as a hobby because my kids are older and I have some free time. Every day I would write the story of someone who died during World War II and I wrote more than 1,200 of those stories between the 75th anniversary of the end of Pearl Harbor and the 75th anniversary of the signing of the peace with Japan on the battleship Missouri. In the end, he wants to create a searchable database, even a smartphone app, so users could visit a place like this, scan a name on a headstone. Yep, that's his story, and we've got it all written here, so someone could read it while they're visiting his gravesite. And be taken straight to a web page that tells the soldier's story. And I think it'll give them an idea of what freedoms we have in this country because these people paid the price. It isn't going to be easy. So far, he's only compiled about 1,200 profiles. I'm looking for the grave of uh, Harry Nelson. So he's enlisting help researching these enlisted men and women. His plane actually ditched in the ocean, so this is a cenotaph grave. He's not actually here. He wants family members and friends to submit stories about their heroes who died and volunteers to help write about these historic men and women. They just visit grave sites, find a name of someone who died in World War II, and write their story. It only takes an hour or two to write a story. We give you free access to research sites like Ancestry, newspapers, Full 3, and if you can write an obituary, you can do one of these stories. Already, people from all over the country and all over the world have offered to take part. We don't have a lot of professional genealogists, historians that are helping us out. It's mostly just 
people that have some free time, they have a love for those who serve our country, they want to see their stories remembered. And so they're writing these stories. It's amazing. His objective may seem ambitious, overwhelming, and impossible. His story is he was in the 66th um, Infantry Division. But compared to the goal these heroes fought for in faraway lands more than 75 years ago, it's the least he can do. There's no reason in the year 2020 why we can't have grave sites that are more than just names on stone. For Veterans Voices, I'm Jeremy Hubbard. All right, guys, we have to take a quick break, but when we return, Lisa Johnson from the Bosher Chamber of Commerce joins us here in the studio. And later we'll sit down with Chris Giordano to tell you everything you need to know about the tastes of the State Fair. Stay with us. We'll be right back.